Watch out! Pokemon has been around for a long time. It boomed with the release of its first titles and has since become the largest media franchise in the world. With massive profits and recognition at its disposal, the Pokemon company was sure to blow us out of the water when they finally started making games on a home console. Well, let's just say, it ended up being a bumpy ride. But we got there eventually. One of the coolest things about Pokemon on Switch, though, is that the series has never released so many games on a single console. This truly felt like the most experimental point in its lifespan, and I mean that in a good way. The sheer variety alone means there's literally a Pokemon game for anyone on Nintendo Switch, depending on what you like. We saw so many spin-offs this console generation, including the return of some fan favorites. We also got so many different takes on mainline Pokemon with the release of not two, not three, but five different games. It's been a wild roller coaster, so let's analyze and dissect how the Nintendo Switch era of Pokemon became one of its most successful yet. A large chunk of what set Pokemon up for success was the release of a little mobile game called Pokemon Go. To say this game was a sensation is an understatement. Fans and non-fans alike flocked to spots in their cities, even their countrysides, just to catch them all. Go did what Pokemon always wanted to do best, bring people together. And some would argue the series has never done a better job than this. Regardless, the Pokemon company isn't dumb. They knew they had success on their hands, and they needed to capitalize on it. So one day, we all woke up to a magical commercial. It was a mainline Pokemon game in 3D, a remake of the original Pokemon adventure, Red and Blue. But there was something else familiar here. The titles of the games were called Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. The name alone was genius because returning fans will recognize Pokemon for what it is, of course, but new fans created by Pokemon Go will see the Go moniker and immediately think this game is for them. Which it kinda was, not gonna lie. It went on to be a massive hit in the sales department. So far it sold about 15 million copies, which is 3 million more than the first remake of Gen 1, Fire Red and Leaf Green, and 1 million more than Pokemon Yellow, the third version of Red and Blue. And it was also 1 million shy of half the sales of the original Red and Blue, but all this money. Yet the game itself was fairly mediocre and panned by consumers, netting an average user score of 6.4 on Metacritic. Not the worst, but definitely not good. After all, Let's Go stripped many modern mechanics out, such as held items and abilities. It also stripped out any Pokemon that released after Gen 1, save for one mythical they released this generation. You can't even get the evolutions to Gen 1 Pokemon that came later, like Politoed or Slowking. It felt wrong that Pokemon we've grown so used to just couldn't be there, not even some of the evolutions. I almost forgot they hadn't been there the whole time. The Sevi Isles from the first remakes were also removed, even though they were the best parts of those remakes. The graphics were extremely basic. Every asset had a smooth, matte finish with no texture. Animations both in fights and in the overworld were basically non-existent. The camera was isometric, the sound design was outdated, and we got watered down versions of old mechanics, like replacing Pokemon Ami with the ability to only feed and pet Pikachu or Eevee. And there was the catching mechanic, which could have been really cool, except it hardly worked properly and was just plain not fun. And look, I'm a guy who loves gimmicks, especially motion control, but even I can't defend this one. There were some good things to be found in this game though. Follow Pokemon were done spectacularly, and blended seamlessly within the overworld. You could even ride some of them. Not only that, but wild Pokemon roamed the overworld, which quickly became a fan favorite evolution for the series that we never want to see leave again. The graphics may have been bad, but the art style was still cohesive. Colors popped, and certain things did still look really good, like the water. Co-op was a fun additional feature as well, and it generally was just pretty cool to see the Kanto region in 3D. Let's Go seems to have succeeded in bringing new fans in, but Game Freak promised us that a game made for veteran players would be coming soon. A brand new generation that would, uh, shock us, to say the least. 
Pokemon Sword and Shield. I, I think we were all thrown off right from the beginning of this game's reveal when we found out Pokemon was working on its first big shiny new game for Nintendo Switch that wasn't simply a remake, we expected something truly next gen for the series. All of us were pretty let down when the first trailer dropped and it was just, I don't know, more of the same? It really did look just like Sun and Moon, but in HD. Even the camera was permanently locked to a top-down isometric view at all times. There were some other worrisome aspects in the trailer as well. It looked like overworld Pokemon had been removed in favor of returning to random encounters in the grass, which sucked because Pokemon roaming the overworld was arguably the most praised aspect of Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. And the new mechanic of just blowing the Pokemon up in size was confusing and honestly pretty lame no matter how you cut it. I'm not sure about anyone else, but as soon as I saw this trailer I thought to myself, okay, well, I thought I was going to be excited for this, but I guess I'm just not interested anymore. I simply wasn't interested in a series that refused to evolve with the industry, especially after other franchises like Zelda, Mario, hell, even God of Freaking War evolved so well for the new generation. Eventually, the Pokemon Company released another trailer. This time, wild Pokemon were shown roaming the environments, a variety of biomes with all of our favorite creatures inhabiting them. Now we're talking. There was even a controllable camera and the camera was no longer locked to a top-down perspective. But this newfound excitement was short-lived. Not too long after, Game Freak did a treehouse event in which they showed off their new, big feature. It turns out, it wasn't actually a variety of biomes featuring these Pokemon, nor was this what the whole game would look like. It was just one area of the entire region that we can go to to find a variety of Pokemon and control the camera. This is what Game Freak called the wild area. What we thought were different biomes were actually just abrupt weather changes that change in an instant depending on where you are on the map. On top of this, it looked ugly. And yes, it still looks exactly like this in the final release, Nintendo 64 trees included. Honestly, this was bad enough, but players, myself included, were still probably going to excuse these aspects anyways, because after all, this is a game where we could spend time with our favorite virtual pets, was it not? Well. That's the thing. It was not. In this same treehouse, Junichi Masuda of Game Freak revealed that not every Pokemon would be returning in Sword and Shield. The reason? So they can have higher fidelity graphics and animations. So like, remember when I said that this just looked like an HD version of Sun and Moon? And I talked about how ugly the wild area looks? Well, that's the real reason people took issue with the Pokedex cuts. It didn't stop there either. After Masuda gave this clearly flawed reasoning, fans started to notice other issues with the game that directly contradicted his statement. Higher quality animations was something Masuda cited for the cuts, yet in the very same treehouse we see move animations that we could hardly call animations at all. Seriously, Game Freak just bounced and twirled models around without having them move their limbs, and we saw it even more when the game released. Seriously, this was so bad that Pokemon didn't even have something as basic as a turning animation. They just rotate unrealistically in place like a creepy floating monster, breaking immersion immediately for any player. The game's release saw even more flaws come to the forefront. Poor frame rate, extreme pop-in, and incorrect size scaling that shrinks every large Pokemon to be shorter than your 10-year-old trainer were just a few of the most glaring issues to be seen right away. All in all, the game's biggest issue with all its flaws is that it broke immersion constantly. We were constantly reminded we were playing a video game, and a rushed one at that. But hear me out, the game itself was still pretty good. If you get past the immersion breaking, Sword and Shield was the most modernized and streamlined version of the traditional Pokemon experience so far. Accessing your PC from anywhere, ability patches, nature mints, a balanced DXP share, joint Poké Centers and Marts, fun competitive strategies, yeah, normally I don't even talk about stuff like that, but Sword and Shield helped me ease into it, and I think there's something to be said about that. There were also other positives with the game as well. I've said this before, but even though the graphics themselves weren't the best, the art style was gorgeous and made the game at least look good when not in motion. Pokemon Camp is still one of the best mechanics in the series, and I spent so many hours playing with my Pokemon here, and just leaving them on the screen to run around while I relaxed after a long day of work. 
The DLC wild areas were massive improvements on the first one, and were genuinely enjoyable. Matter of fact, this was the first time Pokemon gave us a proper DLC instead of releasing a third title altogether, which, to be frank, were also glorified price hike DLCs before DLC ever actually became a thing, but I digress. As for the new Pokemon designs, they were some of my favorites of all time. The music in Sword and Shield was also banging. Seriously, I think Sword and Shield had the best light motif in the entire series. Personally, I loved the Galar region. I loved the towns and cities, the routes, the way the Pokemon League is expressed as a sporting event, the way wild Pokemon were in the overworld but I could also still spark a random encounter in the grass if I wanted. The game's pace was well done and I did feel constantly entertained and compelled to play through to the end. I still believe if it wasn't rushed, Sword and Shield would have been received better by the fans. and. If more effort had gone into making things like the animations better, or even creating actual cutscenes instead of fading to black all the time, then people wouldn't have minded the dex cut so much. Now how can I say this so confidently? Well, because that's exactly what we got soon after. And more. But before I can talk about that, I think now's as good a time as any to discuss the spin-off games, as most of them released around this time. But let's start with some of the ones that released before Sword and Shield. Pokémon Tournament found a home on Switch with a definitive version that finally gave the game the attention it deserved. This was the first Pokémon game on Switch, and it's a high quality one. It would have been a shame if this game stayed on Wii U to be forgotten for all eternity. From what I gather, the competitive scene in Pokémon is also pretty healthy, and players seem extremely happy with the quality and style of the game. I still need to pick it up for myself one of these days. How doesn't Pokémon Tekken sound cool? Does anyone here remember Pokemon Quest? I barely do, but this was technically the first Pokemon game on Nintendo Switch that wasn't simply a port. Crazy, right? The gameplay was insanely simple. It'd actually be fairly accurate of me to say the game literally plays itself. The cute block style aesthetic is endearing though, and I'll admit there's a certain satisfaction to be had going through its gameplay loop. But the enjoyment really is short lived and Quest seems to have been all but forgotten. What hasn't been forgotten is the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon series, so much so that PMD1 got its very own remake on Nintendo Switch, with a gorgeous hand-drawn aesthetic that oozes with personality. The gameplay is much harder and more tactical than mainline Pokemon, as positioning on the map and surprise attacks are important to consider for survival. Think Fire Emblem meets Pokemon. If you know the Mystery Dungeon series, you know it's a fan favorite spinoff, but Sadly, DX didn't sell very well for Pokemon, just under 2 million copies actually, which likely means we'll never see another Mystery Dungeon game again. And that especially hurts since PMD2, Explorers of Time, Dark, and Sky is generally regarded as the best in the series, and I think we all would have much preferred if that had been remade over the first game. You know what we got a lot of though? Pokemon Cafe. I'm not sure who played this game, or how much they did or why, but apparently it was enough for them to not only keep the game going with add-ons, but it even released a second version later on with a remixed moniker. I don't really have much to say about it as it's mostly a mobile game that also got a Switch release, but I do think the art style is super charming, even if it is a shame that this is what Genius Sonority, the developers of Pokemon Coliseum and XD Gale of Darkness, have been reduced to making for the Pokemon company. What ended up being anything but disappointing though, was Pokemon Unite. Which is funny because no one was happy about this game's reveal. However, that's because we were all left with a nasty taste in our mouths from Sword and Shield, and we're hoping for Game Freak to release patches for the game or at least announce something new and better. So when the Pokemon company said they had a huge announcement and made a Pokemon Presents just for this one reveal, I don't think a Pokemon League of Legends game is what any of us were expecting or hoping for. But by golly, I'm glad we got this game. The meta has seen its ups and downs since its release, but one thing's for sure, this game is fun and Pokemon feels right at home with this style of gameplay. I still play Pokemon Unite to this day and I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. I'm kind of addicted. But I think the real shiner of the Pokemon spinoffs is the one that did show what Pokemon on Switch is truly capable of. A spinoff title that exudes confidence in showcasing our beloved Mons in true HD. To top it all off, it was the return of a fan favorite spinoff series, 
New Pokemon Snap was Bandai Namco saying, hold my beer, after the backlash of Sword and Shield, and let us realize what Pokemon could look like if given the time and effort. Environments were grand and detailed, Pokemon models had texture and were animated to look so natural in their habitats, levels in New Snap felt like an epic, interactive adventure, even more so than the original did back on Nintendo 64. Not a single person was mad that this sequel was made, even if it was over two decades late. Detective Pikachu tops the spinoffs off with a whimper. As someone who was excited for this game, imagine my disappointment with the bloated dialogue and text boxes, janky movement, and simple puzzles. I didn't play very far into the game before giving up on it, but from what I see online, it seems I did the right thing by quitting while I was ahead. If you liked this game, please comment why down below and let me know if I should pick it back up. All in all, even looking at these spin-offs, it's clear that the theme for the Switch era of Pokemon was experimentation. There was such a diverse lineup of games featuring our favorite creatures. Most of them were successful, either critically or even just by sales. And speaking of experimental, it's time to talk about more experimentation from the mainline games. Remember when fans complained Sword and Shield needed more time in the oven for its ambition? When we said Game Freak might need to give the franchise up to a company who would craft the games with quality? It's as if Game Freak saw those complaints and said, hold my beer, I know exactly how to shut them up. And shut us up they did, because Game Freak outsourced their next game to a company that has never made a video game before completely serious, and forced them to make the most basic, bare-bones remake we've ever seen in our lives. Now, I kind of find the chibi art style endearing, and I think on a whole the game looks good in the overworld, but no one can deny how disappointing it is that these remakes were so… oh, what's the word they used? Faithful. Not even faithful to Platinum a game I still never have and apparently never will get to play. No, BDSP was a nearly one-to-one -one remake of Diamond and Pearl, so any added content or improvements that were put in Platinum were conveniently left out. There were some additions here that were nice, some character customization, follow Pokemon, improved Amity Square mechanics, but all in all, this just wasn't the game we wanted. We expected Sinnoh remakes to be immersive in 3D, since planning would take so much less time, as the story, world, and scenarios were already written over a decade ago. The devs could have focused all their time on making a game that looks and runs better than Sword and Shield. Sadly, that's not what happened. Which stung all the more, since I'm sure you've seen by now the video I made showcasing what Ilka Inc. originally intended these remakes to look like, only to be told they have less than a year to make the game, which was their first game leaving us, the fans, with this rushed cash grab. Again, this game is still cute, it runs well, glitches are fairly rare, but BDSP will forever go down in history as the reason fans will always hesitate to ask for a remake of a beloved Pokemon game. But all was not lost. Game Freak still had a plan up their sleeve. A passion project, actually. On February 21st, 2021, immediately after the reveal of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, fans had lost all hope. Sword and Shield left us with a bad taste in our mouths, and BDSP's reveal knocked our teeth out. But the Pokemon Company had one more reveal for us. The screen flashed to tell us that Pokemon is entering a new era, signaling to us that what we were about to see would blow our minds. As paintbrush strokes filled dusty old pages in front of our eyes, the narrator described a wonderful world of Pokemon that sounded lively, as if they were living, breathing creatures in the real world. I said to myself, great, now show us that. Stop just describing these things. And what I saw next blew my mind. And by the reactions I've seen on the internet, I know I wasn't the only one. A painted mountain sprung to life, revealing a fully rendered world with a full-bodied Pokemon trainer overlooking a cliff. Shots of gorgeous valleys, slopes, and beaches took over. 
Pokemon were living in their natural habitats, frolicking around as a classical orchestral track played in the background. Then, we saw our trainer dodge roll into the grass. Damn! She snuck up behind a wild Shinx and right there, on the spot without sparking a battle, threw a Pokeball to catch it. This was groundbreaking. After that, we witnessed Pokemon battles take place right there on the spot in the overworld. Pokemon actually running up to hit each other when they attack. The immersion this game had to offer sold us immediately. There's literally never been a game like this before. And thus began Pokemon's journey to redemption. Now, I hold Pokemon Legends in a very special place, personally. Not only was this the game that helped put me on the map here on YouTube, but it was a game that really felt like it was made for players just like me. Funny enough, when I was playing Sword and Shield's DLC, I found an area with Tyrantrum near a giant tree, and I remember trying not to let him see me so I could get to where I was going without sparking a battle. As I did that, I said to myself, wouldn't it be cool if that Tyrantrum could actually hurt me? And if I actually did need to sneak around it to survive? Man, that sounds so cool, but we're definitely never getting a game like that. And then a year later, Pokemon released another trailer for Pokemon Legends Arceus, and the big reveal is that the Pokemon actually attack you. I mean, can you even imagine what went through my mind? When Pokemon Legends released, it proved to be even higher quality than we already anticipated. Details big and small constantly surprised us as we played, and by the end, we were left with an unforgettable experience. An intimate journey with our Pokemon that grew us closer to them and the world they inhabit. Game Freak made a quality product. They showed us they can do it. They bought themselves some time by outsourcing some cheap remakes to Ilka Inc. And Game Freak, yeah, you didn't disappoint with your release. If we could just help them fight for more development time, I have no doubt they can make games of even higher quality. But sadly, they were still on a strict schedule, and another ultra-ambitious title was already on the way. When Pokemon Scarlet and Violet were revealed, a lot of us were kind of fatigued. We barely finished Legends Arceus at this point, and were just really happy to have finally gotten a good Pokemon game. That's not to say SV's reveal wasn't exciting though. After all, it looked like more of what we saw in Pokemon Legends. Game Freak was ready to find a middle ground between their traditional mainline titles and their all-out innovation of Pokemon Legends, and we were excited to see what they had in store with that. The entire lead-up to SV was overall very promising. There was a worrisome trailer or two, but they'd always get outshined by subsequent ones. It wasn't until we got early previews and reviews of the game that things got a little dicey. Gaming outlets were reporting insanely bad frame rates, myriads of glitches, and an overall unstable game. We figured this was just some pre-release issues and that it would be fixed up in a day one patch. Suffice to say, that was not the case. You see, SV suffered from a massive memory leak problem, which caused all the issues that I mentioned the outlets reporting on, and it was still there on release. For me, Scarlet and Violet exists in two eras. There's Scarlet and Violet with memory leak, and Scarlet and Violet post memory leak. Now, Scarlet and Violet with memory leak is arguably the worst Pokemon game ever made. It doesn't run, it doesn't function, it's not a playable game. This era lasted almost an entire year, and I couldn't even touch it. I refused to slog through the glitches and crashes, and to top it off, the unstable frame rate gave me migraines. It was like getting seasick on a boat. If this isn't proof SV needed more development time, I don't know what is. The Pokemon Company even issued an official statement promising they care about quality and will release a fix, but with how long it took, it wasn't long before we stopped believing them. Eventually, the memory leak got silently fixed in a random update. No word from the Pokemon Company or Nintendo on it. They just fixed it one day. It's as if they didn't want to admit the problem they sat on for nearly a year after promising to fix it. But this was when I was finally able to play the game, and I can happily report that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Post Memory Leak is one of the best Pokemon games ever made. It finally feels like the product they meant to release in 2022. SV as it's meant to be played is ambitious, well-designed, well-written, and above all else, great fun. 
When I tell you this is the best story in a Pokemon game, I mean it. It's so good that I'd put it up there in the grand scheme of game stories in general. A mix of personal struggle and bonding with Pokemon has never been done so well. Genuine plot twists caught us by surprise, and with the three-stage DLC, these surprises just kept coming. Pokemon finally expanded concretely on so much of its lore, and answers were wholly satisfying. The open world was wonderfully crafted, giving plenty of memorable spots to enjoy taking your Pokemon out for a stroll or picnic. Oh yeah, did I mention this is the best follow Pokemon mechanic we've had in a non-isometric Pokemon game. And Picnic has plenty of features included to let us feel close to our little pals. Character customization was the best it's ever been for the characters themselves. I was literally able to make Bayonetta as a Pokemon trainer, which is kinda wild. Though the clothing options being limited to assorted uniforms was kind of a letdown, at least accessories were fully customizable. Now that Scarlet and Violet have been patched up and include a three-stage DLC, I find it to be a great end to an era of Pokemon. Pokemon on Nintendo Switch took us for a wild ride of ups and downs with its experimentation, but generally trending towards the positive by the end is a good look no matter how you slice it. What do you think the next era will look like though? Let me know down in the comments and afterwards catch up with more of my videos, including my ranking of the mainline Pokemon Switch games. The link is right in front of you. I've been Johto Johnny. Enjoy everyone.